Welcome back, Exile, to another video in Noodle's complete lore series. This video covers the legacy of the Val. Let's get started. In Path of Exile, we start the game in the year 1599 IC, which stands for Imperialis Conceptus, the founding of the Eternal Empire. There are many different civilizations currently in this world, the Oriath and the Templars, the Karui, the Marraketh, the Azmiri, and the Ezemites. There are also two civilizations that have been almost entirely wiped out by catastrophic events. The Eternals, who caused the Cataclysm of 1336 IC that devastated Rayclast, and the Val, an ancient civilization that brought a similar devastation in 400 BIC. While remnants of the Val civilization remains, for the most part the Val were completely destroyed. But the influence of the Val, their thaumaturgy, their technology, and their beliefs is still prevalent. Their intermingling with the Asmiri in 900 BIC led to the first recordings of history, and their actions in 400 BIC that caused the fall of the Val inspired Malachi to take similar actions in his time, which caused the cataclysm that destroyed the Eternals. The Val's history spans way before the first official recordings of history in 900 BIC. There is a creation myth of the Val about a person or entity named Zibakwa. Zibakwa was born from the flesh of the gods, and from the carnage of Zibakwa we were born. One by one, the gods reclaimed their flesh, until all that remained was a droplet of pure light, the first Val. Perhaps the Val were the first people of Rayclast. They were certainly the first people to develop an advanced civilization with a focus on exploration, technology, and progress. Before 900 BIC, Sin created the Beast, and before the Beast, there were gods. The Beast was created to put all the gods to sleep, and its creation led to the formation of Virtue Gems and Thaumaturgy. The Val were the first civilization to utilize these powerful gems. Even when the Val integrated with the Asmiri, they kept their use of these powerful gems to themselves. Trinian, a man tasked with studying and compiling the history of Rayclast, writes that our literature was conceived and born within the Asmiri's cultural marriage with the Val. Despite an exhaustive search, neither account nor passing reference can be found regarding gem usage amongst the early Asmiri. Though they described the Val as having flesh adorned with glittering crystals, our Asmirian ancestors were never privy to the gem's potentials or powers. The Val shared agriculture, technology, and language with the Asmiri, but did not share their most powerful and arguably most distinct accomplishment, the discovery and use of virtue gems, which they called Tears of Magi. There is evidence the Val civilization was not limited to the continent of Rayclast. Their accomplishments were studied in Oriath long after the fall, but they were actually present on Oriath before the fall. Templar Devaro, who lived just before we begin our journey, was asked to study Val artifacts brought to High Templar Dominus. In his first journal, Devaro writes, I have seen signs of blood and ancient sacrifice in the ghostings of our precious city. Could it be that these echoes point to the Val culture having extended all the way to the shores of Oriath? And in his second journal, he confirms, My theory that the Val once dwelt in this land has proven fruitful. One of their ancient sites lies not far north from here. Through my thaumaturgy, I was granted special sight. I saw the ancient Val city that once stood in this place. All around me were signs of the legendary Queen Atziri ruling from afar. In addition, there are Val symbols used amongst the Templars as well. The symbols of the Val Totems and Zeal's Amplifier are the same as the Templar Descry. While the Templar could have simply been inspired by the Val symbols, if the Val were on Oriath, they possibly interacted directly with the Templars. The Val inspired or directly influenced many of the civilizations in Path of Exile. But what made the Val the most influential civilization in history? Their most obvious contribution was their discovery and use of the Tears of Magi. These gems, in their pure form, appeared in the caverns underneath Mount Veruso in tandem with the beast's creation and where Sin's beast resides. Aramir, an Oriathan scholar who fled Oriath and lives among some Asmiri on Rayclast, recounts that, 
It is the Val who began the use of virtue gems well before our imperial ancestors. Isius Parandus, a scholar who worked in the Sarn Library, claims the Val were even more steeped in gem culture than our emperor, referring to Emperor Chittis Parandus, and his gemlings. It's an obsession as old as civilization itself. The Val's Tears of Magi are the predecessors to the modern virtue gems our own exile uses on our journey. The Val figured out how to use these gems to gain powers and fuel their civilization's advancement. By tapping into the gem's power, the Val were able to make huge advancements in their civilization far beyond the capabilities of their contemporaries, and the way they fueled these gems was a form of magic called blood thaumaturgy. The Val are perhaps most notorious for this blood thaumaturgy as it required sacrifices, sometimes on a massive scale. In Oriath, Aramir was tasked with studying Val artifacts by High Templar Dominus, much like Templar Devaro, who we touched on earlier. But Aramir found it rather baffling to think of the Val as a people who believed in science and progress while they constructed elaborate sacrificial altars in the center of their cities. However, it was these sacrifices that allowed the Val to make progress. While modern thaumaturgy and virtue gems can be powered without sacrifices, the Val relied on blood thaumaturgy. They used sacrifice and murder to extract souls from victims, and these souls are what powered their tears of magi. Aramir's former colleague, Templar Devaro, would argue that blood thaumaturgy was more powerful than modern thaumaturgy, that the Templars had no idea as to the power they have ignored in the blood thaumaturgy they forbade. Devaro even dabbled in this blood thaumaturgy himself, recalling how he purchased three Karui slaves from the marketplace, strapping young lads of 17. At the blood site in the ancient ruins, they pleaded with me, something about the place, the corruption ingrained in the stonework. It spoke to them, and they knew. The powers demand blood, so I gave it to them. I opened the throats of those Karui lads and poured out their essence onto Atziri's altar. The artifacts that Devaro studied had their own form of blood thaumaturgy, giving Devaro visions and singing to him. He claims that the singing of the relics, to me, no longer pains my ears. In fact, I hear music in them, songs revealing great truths to me. While Devaro felt these relics and visions gave him great insight, they also drove him to madness, and Devaro died after killing two children he'd abducted and himself in an attempt to join Atziri as a family in the afterlife. Even before the Tears of Magi, the Val were curious about the power of sacrifice. The Val gods Ralakesh and Arakali dabbled in sacrifices. Arakali lured her victims to her temple by presenting as a lust-filled woman and then turning into a spider to drain her victim's life force. She used these victims to create medicines for her people. Healer of hearts, Arakali, with the juices of lust and the venom of the spider, she brought back many from the brink of death. When Arakali died, her people began dying as well. Our queen's medicines had once sustained us. Now famine and plague ravaged what little remained of our lands. The god Ralakesh enslaved and killed local Asmiri and his own people to study the best way to control people and extract obedience. This history formed their society around slavery and sacrifice. The flavor text of The String of Servitude reads, For the Val, the relationship between slave and master was as intimate and volatile as that of lovers. Sacrifice as a means to progress was so integral, many were willing to give their lives for the advancement of the Val. However, the sacrifices were not always clean and simple. In fact, many thaumaturgical advancements came from exploring suffering and torturing sacrifices. So great was the thaumaturgy of the blood priest's mark that sacrifices soon welcomed their death, is the flavor text of the Mark of Submission. The Val god Yugal and the infamous Xerfi studied how terror and torture could be utilized. Blood thaumaturgy and sacrifices were not always neat and consensual. Sacrifices were mostly performed to power and create thaumaturgy, but were also used to gain knowledge about the human condition and advance their technology. 
According to the flavor text of the Sacrificial Harvest Jewel, the Val used human sacrifice to power their empire. They, too, eventually sought means to make their machines run more efficiently. The Val gods Yugal and Ralakesh sacrificed to study human nature. Yugal focused on the power of terror, and Ralakesh wanted to tap into the human instincts that swayed people to obey his rule. Yugal said of his studies, Civilization is a costume worn to conceal our truest natures. Oh, that we could become terrified children once again, that we could understand in an instant that everything is hopeless, everything is death. There is no next step, no reprieve. Life is terror, and terror is life. The Val found knowledge through these dark acts. The Val's elaborate and lasting architecture is also a testament to their desire for progress and longevity. The ruins we explore in Act 2 and 8 are huge and intricate. Another stunning Val relic is the Temple of Atsawatl, built as a hub of technological innovation. The lore compilation document I reference often says that Val ruins are populated in part by creatures referred to as constructs, said by Alva Valet to have been created by combining metal and insects. It continues, the Val conducted research into such areas as explosives, electric lifebloods, bioengineering, and weather manipulation, and they studied other realms, including breaches and maps. Alva, a master NPC with Val ancestry, is fascinated with Val artifacts and particularly the Temple of Atsawatl. Using her own blood, she's able to perform a ritual of blood thaumaturgy to travel back to the Temple of Atsawatl during its construction. Alva tells us that the Lost Temple of Atsawatl is said to be the most famed in all Val history and myth. Best I can tell, the temple began its construction in the final years of the Val Empire. Some say it was a place of darkness, home to the most vile of sacrifices, but there are others who claim the temple to be the birthplace of technology. Even our own is said to pale in comparison to what was being forged within those walls. We can travel back in time with Alva to influence the final construction of the Temple of Atsawatl, which can include rooms studying breaches, empowering the Omnitect, the mechanical boss of the temple, altering gems, generating tempests, and studying corruption itself. Besides the temple's Omnitect, one notable Val technological creation we encounter is the Val Oversoul in Act 2. This large, creature-like machine is released when we break an ancient seal while traveling through the Val ruins. The Val Oversoul continued to exist and operate past the fall of the Val in 400 BIC, and actually terrorized the Eternals in the infancy of the Empire, founded by Asmiri Tarkas Veruso. Trinian wrote that five years after Veruso's death, Emperor Caspiro II was dead. Caspiro was dismembered by something referred to simply as a dark being. As we know, this dark being was the Val Oversoul. After we break the ancient seal, the area around the Val ruins, stretching all the way to the forest encampment, is covered in a dark haze. The Val Oversoul's presence in 35 IC caused this same darkness. Though it seems fanciful to contemplate a portion of our empire cast in perpetual night, Asmerian writers of the time are unified in their depiction. It was General Alano Frisia who avenged the emperor's death and who triumphed in driving away the pervasive darkness. Alano himself wrote that our legions drove the dark being deep into the recesses of its lair and sealed it away for eternity. So, the Val successfully created a sentient machine that was not only powerful, but could control the weather in an area. The Val used sacrifice to combine lives and souls with their gems and technology. While the methods are brutal, the results are inarguable. Their thaumaturgy, technological accomplishments, and the fantastic architectural sites are what made the Val so fascinating to many civilizations after their fall. Perhaps the most well-known site of the Val is Azala Val, which is where Queen Atsiri reigned. Queen Atsiri was the last ruler of the Val, and it was her thaumaturgist, Doriani, working to grant Queen Atsiri eternal beauty and literal immortality, who caused the fall of the Val in 400 BIC. Azala Val is where Sarn, the capital city of the Eternal Empire, was built. 400 years after the fall, 
Tarkas Baruso descended from the mountains and led his 80,000 tribesmen and women through the doomlands of Azala Val. There he planted his banner on Atziri's grave, and with these words, founded our great and eternal empire. Baruso condemned the Val and their use of thaumaturgy, but choosing Atziri's grave in Azala Val as the capital of his new empire is, in its own way, reverence for the legacy of the Val. We can't discuss the accomplishments of the Val civilization without discussing their fall. As mentioned previously, and will be discussed in further detail later, Queen Atziri was obsessed with retaining her youth and achieving immortality like the gods before the beast. Her thaumaturgist, Doriani, was absolutely prolific in his contributions to blood thaumaturgy, and his inspiration was direct communication with the beast itself. Malachi, the thaumaturgist responsible for the modern cataclysm of 1336 IC, also had communion with the beast. Perhaps the beast desired these apocalyptic occurrences and influenced these thaumaturgists, knowing their desire for power and progress would lead them to causing these catastrophes. Certainly, neither the fall nor the cataclysm would have happened without power-hungry thaumaturgists seeking to reach the source of all thaumaturgy, the beast. The fall of the Val was caused by Doriani entering the beast in a ritual referred to as Doriani's Cradle. Doriani created an entrance into the beast that we reopen in Act 9 and took virtue gems into the beast for his ritual. Physical interaction with the beast was also what caused Malachi's cataclysm. Even though Doriani's thaumaturgy and decision to perform this ritual was influenced by the beast, and the beast is the source of all thaumaturgy, this ritual and interaction caused the fall. Doriani's ritual killed millions of Val, leaving only a few thousand survivors. Trinian wrote about the fall of the Val, thousands of years in the making, gone in a blink of Solaris's burning eyes. The Asmiri tell of the Valish immigration, small bands of tattered, shambling survivors, bereft of families, their wealth, and in many cases, their sanity. They were welcomed and cared for, but none could give the Asmiri the one thing they sought in return. None could tell them how the Val realm came to such a sudden and catastrophic end. 3,126 survivors from a civilization counting in its millions. It could be that the survivors were not aware of Doriani's actions, but considering they lived alongside the Esmeri for 500 years without sharing their interest and use in virtue gems and thaumaturgy, they could still have been protecting these secrets even in the aftermath. In the distant repository memory seen in Synthesis League, we hear Aramir reflecting on his own studies of the Val. He says, I used to pride myself in taking care of these tomes, but the ancient treatises concerning the Val should be burned. He's making me research for him, and the things I'm reading concern the destruction of all mankind. I would think my fears of the end of the world ridiculous, except it's happened before. A brief summary of the Val timeline is as follows. The first Val was Zibakwa, who formed from the flesh of gods. Sometime between then and the creation of the beast, there were the gods, who may have all lived at the same time due to their long lifespan, Yugal, Arakali, and Ralakesh. After the creation of the beast, and after the peaceful Asmiri contact in 900 BIC, there was Zerfi. Zerfi lived before Queen Atsiri, who lived alongside Kishara, Doriani, started the Temple of Atsawadal, and caused the fall of the Val in 400 BIC. The Val Oversoul reappeared around 35 IC. Isius Perandus recorded his series on the history of Rayclast around 1330 IC. Then, just before current times, Aramir and Templar Devaro studied Val artifacts for High Templar Dominus. And in the current year, 1599 IC, we work with Alva, who has Val ancestry and blood. We've already touched on the Val gods before the beast, so we'll look more at the Val who lived before the fall. One of the most famous Val who lived after the creation of the beast was Zerfi. Zerfi was a Valish noble who lived for 168 years, and his longevity was a huge inspiration to Queen Atsiri. Zerfi's long life was not typical of Val or any person of this time. Zerfi had actually discovered a blood thaumaturgy that allowed him to live this long, but his actions were not condoned by the Val rulers. 
he was considered the Val's most infamous serial killer. Over a period of 128 years, Zerfi abducted, tortured, and murdered 13 victims, all in their 20th year of life. All of noble descent. All gemlings. Perhaps it was Zerfi's choice of nobles and gemlings, rather than slaves or willing victims, that changed his status from thaumaturgist to serial killer. His pursuits were also wholly selfish, as he did not desire to share the knowledge gained from his murders with others. His sacrifices were only meant to elongate his own life. Compared to the mass sacrifices condoned by the Val, 13 victims is almost nothing. But it was not the amount of people Zerfi killed, it was the quality of his heinous acts that set him apart. Zerfi inflicted insane torture on his victims, mutilating them while they were alive. Some sources claim that the techniques of torture were so refined that he was able to inflict the most intense and lasting pain the human body is capable of sustaining. Zerfi's choice of victims, 20-year-old gemling nobles, was very intentional. When Zerfi was found dead next to his final victim, his body was not that of a 160-year-old man, but of a 20-year-old. Zerfi's blood thaumaturgy allowed him to become physically like his victims while still retaining his own appearance and mind. What's interesting is that Zerfi was found dead next to his final victim, and while the victim was dead, he was unmolested and unmutilated. Zerfi's cause of death is unknown. Zerfi's previous victims did not die until they were tortured to the absolute maximum. So what caused Zerfi to die? What caused his final victim to die if he was not tortured at all? How long could Zerfi have lived if this strange reaction hadn't happened? Since Zerfi did not record the methods or results of his sacrifices, his dark art will remain a mystery. On a lighter note, a contemporary of Adziri was the great explorer named Kishara. In Act 8, Whalem wants us to recover her star, a compass that assisted Kishara in her travels. Whalem describes Kishara as a tough-as-nails Val Lassie, said to have explored every coast, cove, and bay of this blasted continent with the help of her star, said to be fair humming with thaumaturgy, able to guide its mistress wherever she be fixing to journey. So, Kishara's star was a thaumaturgical invention. Whether Kishara created the star herself or had it created isn't mentioned. We also cannot say that the star was not created with blood thaumaturgy or sacrifice. But Kishara's intentions were clearly more benevolent than other famous Val we've seen. She wanted to explore the world and document her findings about other locations and peoples. Somehow, Kishara got on the bad side of Queen Atziri. Whalem muses that Adziri weren't the most understanding of lasses, implying Adziri was hostile towards other women and perhaps jealous of Kishara's accomplishments. He adds Kishara may have upset Adziri with some spiky facts about the outside world, so it could have been the information Kishara had documented that upset Adziri rather than Kishara herself. Either way, Adziri took her ship and made sacrifices of her crew forced the poor girl into hiding. But before she left, Kishara hid the star somewhere near the causeway. Kishara was able to escape Adziri's wrath. Whalem wants us to retrieve Kishara's star so that he and his granddaughter Lily can explore the world together with the help of this thaumaturgical compass, which is actually very sweet. Now we must talk about the Val's most recognizable and notorious ruler, Queen Adziri. Inspired by Zerfi, Adziri wanted to obtain immortality. She had her thaumaturgist, Doriani, pursue this dream. While Doriani's actions were the ultimate cause of the fall of the Val, it was all supported by Queen Adziri. Whether his decision to create Doriani's cradle, the act that caused the fall, was part of this particular pursuit is unclear. But under Adziri's rule and Doriani's thaumaturgy, the Val civilization hit its peak. The flavor text of Doriani's Fist reads, Doriani's ingenuity raised the Val Empire to unprecedented heights. His curiosity reduced it to ruins and bones. Adziri may not have directed all of Doriani's actions and creations, but she was certainly the benefactor that allowed him to enact his thaumaturgy. 
and Doriani's thaumaturgy required a great amount of sacrifice and blood. Sin claims that, in neglecting to provide the beast with ambitions, I made it vulnerable to the ambitions of others, implying Doriani's acts were all his own design. But Doriani claimed, in my dreams, a voice spoke to me. It said, My reach knows no bounds. All that is pure is destined to rot. All that lives is destined to serve. This may be Doriani's beliefs translating the beast's voice into his own desires, but Doriani felt that the beast wanted him to perform these sacrifices. Atziri even took direct part in sacrifices. The river crossing memory in synthesis is from the perspective of a Val person who says, We pack our camp just before sunrise and journey towards the capital, Azala Val. We hear the crowd before we see them. Word of our victory spread quickly, and even the queen has come to meet us. My family has come to watch the ceremony. As I lay on the stone altar, I hear them chanting my name. It's the last thing I hear before the queen's dagger is plunged into my chest. While Adziri did not create the Val culture of ritual sacrifice, she and Doriani embraced it. When returning pages to Siosa about the Val, written by his colleague Isias Parandis, one page reads, she drenches her altar with the blood of those deranged enough to question her vision. And Trinian wrote that Queen Adziri was prepared to slaughter her own people in the desperate pursuit of perpetual youth and beauty. Atziri took advantage of the Val's willingness to sacrifice in the name of progress to use them for her own selfish pursuit. Her vanity was clear in the way she held court. It has been written of Queen Atziri that her throne room was lined with mirrors and that she held court naked, demanding the same of those wishing her audience. The theory was that a naked man had nothing to hide, but one might venture that Atsiri utilized her striking physical presence to influence courtly engagements in her favor. Atsiri recognized and lavished in the power of her physical beauty. The fear of losing this beauty and this power drove her to allow increasingly debaucherous studies of blood thaumaturgy. But Atsiri may not have been entirely self-absorbed as a ruler. The Temple of Atzawatl was the center of many technological advancements by the Val and was created during Queen Atziri's rule. Some speak of Atziri as a visionary, the woman who would lead the Val into a brighter future. Others are less kind, suggesting that Atziri's love for herself overshadowed any love for her people. It's clear Atziri's pursuit of eternal beauty and life was selfish, but Atziri also promoted Val progress and success. However, Adziri's desire for immortality, and presumed lack of results, led to her increased bloodlust. The Val sentencing jewel reads, In their final days, every crime was punishable by death. Adziri's empire ran on blood, but the blood was running dry. The Val had always relied on sacrifice as a means to an end, for research, technology, and thaumaturgy. But Atziri's desperation was the primary catalyst for the overreach and consequent fall of the Val. Unable to achieve Xerfi's supposed immortality, she allowed Doriani to act however he desired with the hope that he could find the secret to eternal life. Instead, the Val found death and destruction on an unimaginable scale. Thanks so much for watching, it's your boy Noodle. If you like these videos, please subscribe, give the video a thumbs up, check out the full playlist in the description. Thanks as always to all my patrons who keep this project going. There may be some delay in upcoming videos as I'll be traveling, but until the next one, stay sane, exile.